Hey Tech Homies, Fletch here. If you like this video, remember to come back every first Monday of the month for the OKC Sharp live stream, and also check out the Gin Studios YouTube channel. Like and subscribe, and let's begin. Welcome, Mark. Hey, hello. Hey. All right, I'm gonna. Is, I'm gonna. Is this thing working? It is. I, I'm hoping to get some feedback from uh, the Twitch chat about the difference between your volume and my volume to make sure that we're pretty much equal. So go ahead and uh, uh, talk for a second and I'll adjust it. Yeah. All right. So uh, hello, my name is Mark Seaman. I can always repeat this uh, introduction if you want me to repeat it later on. But my name is Mark Seaman. I'm calling in from Copenhagen, Denmark at the moment. It's um, it's uh, half past six here and it's pitch black. Uh, well, it's Copenhagen. It's a big city, so it's not really pitch black. But it, you know, it could have been pitch black if it hadn't been for all the city lights. How about that? Yeah, sounds good. They're saying it sounds good inside Twitch. So, all right. All right. I'm glad we get to talk again. Uh, let me pull up my notes here. Oop. Okay, so. Uh, Mark, I've always been a, a longtime fan of yours, uh, and, and so I'm going to... I've referenced your your blog a number of times, uh, blog.plo.dk. So my first yeah. question is, how do you pronounce that? Is that Plo? And what's the origin uh, of it? Yeah, well, I, you know, if... if um, I, I pronounce it Plo, um, Plo. Um, but uh, the origin is, is a secret, so I, I can't tell you or anyone else for that matter, unfortunately. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> it's a little bit it scary. Must and... a mystery. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Um, so uh, the the last thing that that I d watched that you were part of was the .NET Rocks uh, uh, coverage of your of your book release. Right. So yes. uh, in that you you talked about your your story about bisect about how we're using Git bisect uh, oh, yeah. in order to find an issue and your issue ended up being. As you said inside that interview, um, a state-based malfunction. So I believe mm -hmm. you focus on imperative shell functional core as much as possible. Yeah. And sure. could you dive into some details on what uh, state-based mutation is and how it applies how it applies to someone who's doing imperative shell functional core type development? Um, what is state-based mutation as it relates right. to that? Okay. Yeah. So, so this is a big topic, but I, I you know, can you you'd always stop me if I start to ramble because I, I have a tendency to just keep going until you stop me. Um, but um, in short, state-based mutation is when we change values in place, which is a very normal thing to do in object-oriented programming. It's also a very you know normal thing to do in in you know more old-fashioned procedural programming. So if, if you imagine, for example, that you have a for loop and uh, you start by having some sort of you know a counter, and then you go through that for loop, and for each you know each you know round through that for loop, you increment the count or something like that. That's actually an in-place state mutation because you you're mutating, you're changing the in this case the value of the of the counter as as you go along. Um, now these sorts of very local state changes are actually not that um, they're not that dangerous um, because if 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 that counter variable if that never escapes the procedure that you're um, you know within when you're doing the for loop it's really just a local thing and 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 if the for loop is part of a method body or a procedure body that's not too big in itself you can probably you know you know keep track in your head of you know what's the state of that count is going to be like um, but um, in general, if you have um, you know mutable state on an object or so, you know, some data structure, and let's just call them objects, um, you could have all sorts of procedures that change the state of the object. So we see that a lot in object-oriented programming, where you have some sort of uh, we have some object that represents some some things, and you know it might be a you know a user object, for example. Um, Let's say that we have an object that represents a user, a user who's logged into the system, and uh, and now we want to make a change to that user object. Uh, and uh, what we could do in, in a typical object-oriented fashion is to say, um, let's make that change. Let's change the first name, for example, if the user has uh, decided that uh, uh, you know the first name that they have was not appropriate anymore. They wanted to change the name. Um, we could do that, and we could say, let's change the name, you know, inside of the object, and we change the, the value of the field, and that's what we call, uh, you know, state state mutation. We change the state of of the object. 
Um, so one of the problems with with doing that is that you know as 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 long as you consider that in a local scope, it's it's actually not that problematic and it's it feels quite intuitive because you know the all the words we use about you know doing these sorts of things is we say we want to change the first name of the user and you know so it seems seems quite natural then you know then we should go and change the first name field on the user object that's that seems very intuitive um but the problem with that is that it doesn't really scale in in uh, in the sense of our ability to understand larger scale systems so when i talk scale here i'm i'm not talking about you know scalability in the sense of being able to handle millions of users. I'm more talking about the scale in, in, in the sense of a programmer being able to understand uh, the code base as the size of the code base grows. Um, so we can understand you know, small state changes fairly, fairly well. Uh, but once we start to compose you know, objects that have local state changes with other objects that have local state, state changes, and we you know, compound those into larger objects that you know, are composed of all of those smaller objects that have local state changes and so on. It, it starts to become really difficult uh, for for the human brain to keep track of all the stuff that's that's happening. And this is this is a um, you know a, um, a common source of all sorts of of defects and bugs and systems. Uh, that um, you've probably tried this yourself. You're passing an object as a method parameter through some you know some method. And it goes on and does a lot of complicated things, you know, 15 levels deep into the call stack. And somewhere within level 13 in that call stack, something, you know, in a, in a, you know, in a randomly or a rarely executed branch of some logic will go in and, you know, in, in certain circumstances, it'll go and change the state of the input perimeter. So you're calling this method and you're thinking the input perimeter is just going to be input and you're going to, you know, receive something else as output. But unbeknownst to you, um, as a side effect, the, the input object that you passed as an input parameter also changed state and that couldn't really surprise you um, so these sorts of things is um, th these can lead to all sorts of, of very difficult to understand problems in source code uh, and that's why uh, you know this is one of the things one of the reasons why I find functional programming very interesting is because in functional programming you basically say oh those local state changes they're not allowed to you know happen uh, just willy-nilly, uh, you know, you have to have some discipline around, you know, when they happen and they should happen as as rarely as possible. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I was confused. I was always confused by the uh, ref parameter in in the uh, parameter list because uh, object object references, uh, reference objects are always passed by reference anyway. Putting ref is sort of a little bit redundant. But uh, I love the idea now with records that you could, I could say pass in person, my lowercase p, my person mm -hmm. instantiated object with, and then like open close, just an empty open close curly braces. And it's essentially saying, take a copy of that struct and pass it in, whatever, whatever they do with it, it's not going to affect me. Right. But I always tell people, right. of course, if you are expecting to be transforming an object, which they shouldn't be doing, I, I agree with all the things you're saying, is just get rid of it. Um, if you are going to at least be descriptive to the person calling your method by putting that ref mm -hmm. keyword on there, it could be helpful. Uh, but as Floyd Floyd mentioned, just to recap what you were saying, uh, side effects mean in place mutations means headaches. It means that you're you're doing a lot of problems. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's one thing. But 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 another thing that's really interesting when you start to think about you know, um, so so the common question that these you know typically becomes okay if we if we can't change. You know things in place. Then what do we do instead? And and again, if we just go back to some you know a uh, simple example as as this user object that I talked about before, uh, what the um, what the C sharp language feature that you just referred to is. I, I suppose you're referring to this new language feature called Withers, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, so so what that actually does is it it takes a copy of the of the input user objects if, if we're talking about a user object and then it, it it basically takes a copy of all the data that's in the the user object apart from the thing you want changed so if you want to change the first name um, all the other things remain the same but what you get back is a new object it's a copy of the old object with just the first name ch changed for example um, so one of the the benefits of doing that is that um, 
you can actually afterwards, once you've made changes, you can actually go and do a diff, uh, you know, operation on the two objects, you know, the, the before and the after one. And you can actually do that, you know, diff operation to, um, to then figure out, okay, what actually changed. So if you want to persist the change in a database, for example, instead of trying to, to keep, you know, all sorts of dirty flags, uh, you know, on an object itself, um, you can you can uh, make a you know a, a sort of like a, a diff comparison between the two objects or records. Um, but what we normally do instead is that we could you could take this a little bit step further and say instead of having to do all the work of doing a you know a diff um, comparison between two two values, what you can do instead is you can say all all the um, all the operations that you want to perform on objects, on business objects, for example, like you know, changing the first name, um, you could have that function emit a command or an event. Uh, so you simply just, you know, instead of, of returning a new, you know, a new user object, you can, you basically just return the 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 events or the commands that would be the result of that, and then you can go and apply that to your persistent store instead, or you can apply it in memory. Um, so that that's that gives you some flexibility in terms of, you know, how you want to model the interaction between, you know, what happens in memory and what goes back into, you know, a database or you know, document database or whatever else it is. I I I, I don't know if I I, I probably went off on, on a little bit of an, on a tangent there. So uh, reel me in, please. Uh, you know, okay, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. The uh, the weird thing is, um, and people on Twitch wouldn't see this because they could see me, but I hadn't turned my camera on for this meet, so you weren't seeing me. Uh, yeah. But now you can see me, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, let me let me move on to this other thing. In your book, you came across uh, a couple juicy terms, um, which I, I, I think they're juicy terms, feature gating, okay. the maybe monad, separation of concerns, and some other ones like that. And you don't you don't devote entire chapters to those concepts, uh, and I felt like I was like yearning for for more information <laughs> on those. Right. Uh, but right. obviously, your book is the perfect length. I, I loved everything about your oh, book, good. and you don't want it to be so long that it's overwhelming. So, mm -hmm. what topics uh, are there? Any topics in the book that you really wanted to expand on, but it would have made the book explode in size? Um, yeah. Well, um, so so you just asked about the functional core imperative shell. Uh, and and that is definitely something I could write an entire book about, and, and I'm actually you know thinking about doing that at the moment. Um, but I I didn't want to make the the code that fits in your head. I, I didn't want to make that book into you know that topic because that wasn't really my my goal with that book. Um, so 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 that's basically just a thing that's mentioned in passing, saying, oh, you should really look into this because that might actually be quite helpful to you. But you know, it's not that. Uh, it's not a book about functional core imperative shell, and even if you don't want to do, you know, that functional core thing, um, I I still believe that there are you know a lot of other ideas in in the present book that um, that you can probably find useful. Um, so just to um, just to give uh, everyone a, a bit of an idea about what's what was the, what's what was the um, what was the idea with the book? The idea with the book was basically just that I've spent. Uh, years with various different development organizations, coaching them and and sitting them with them and doing mock programming with with various different people, um, doing code reviews for for various different organizations. And over the years, I started to recognize that I was actually, I was um, I was finding ways to explain things to people and you know all sorts of heuristics and rules of thumb where you know if they ask me why do you want to do this instead of that and I, I would say I want to do my particular way because I actually have you know some guiding principles that guide me and 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 um, and this is you know then why I want you to you know you know avoid state mutation instead of, you know, returning a new object, or this is why I want you to write a test here, or this is why I want you to turn on, you know, turn, uh, you know, warnings into errors, or, or whatever it is, there's lots of different things. Um, so um, after, ha after I did that for many years, I thought, well, okay, maybe I should just collect all of those ideas into a sort of coherent narrative. So, so that's the idea with the book. Um, so, so that's also the reason why when you asked, uh, you know, was there something that we could expand on? Because there's lots of things we could expand on. Um, 
why you know why why didn't I do that in this book? And and that's because the point with this book is more like a, a catalog of ideas, more than it's a comprehensive treatment of one specific thing. Um, so so that was that was the goal of the book. Um, yeah. But definitely to get back to your question, you know, something like functional core imperative shell. I could write an, an entire book about that, and that's that's probably you know that's that's one of the that's probably the thing that's closest to my own you know heart at the moment. So that so that's I might actually do that. Okay, I'm going to go off script a little bit here off of uh -huh. my list sure. of questions, but um, uh, functional core imperative shell. I've it's not a one for one, but I've often conflated that with what I call service oriented programming. Do you have any mm -hmm. pros and cons to the idea, or do you think that they're pretty close to the same concept, or what? Um, it's so service oriented is, is more as, as, you know, the way that I see it, it that is more like an, a large scale architecture in the sense that, um, well, unless you go into microservices, we can, we can, you know, just leave that be for a moment. But if, if I think about, you know, more old fashioned service oriented architecture, I, I tend to look at that as more like a large scale architecture. It's almost like enterprise architecture, uh, where you have lots of, you know, you have various systems that may actually be, you know, be programmed in, you know, you could have one system programming Java and another one in C sharp and one, you know, on Python and one in JavaScript. And they all sort of have to, you know, uh, all together, they have to, you know, be this ensemble of systems that, you know, accomplish some sort of business goal. Um, that's you know, when you say service oriented architecture to me, that's what I hear. Um, okay. But I'm also I'm also so old that you know I I was actually a young programmer back when so uh, you know service oriented architecture when that was a buzzword, and that's how we thought about it back then. So I take a lot of my ideas about you know what SOA is. Um, I take a lot of those ideas from Udi Dahan, uh, who defines a service as something like a yes, an autonomous self-contained uh, you, you know thing that enables a business capability, something like that. I can't remember the exact phrase that he uses but it's it's something like that um so so that's more like a large-scale uh you know architecture uh, decision uh, which still might make a lot of sense you know you just have to strip off all the xml and all the soap uh, that sort of came with that territory back then but you know the overall idea is not stupid uh it's actually a pretty pretty good idea um if done right um so in terms of, of functional core imperative shell, I see that more as a, that's a small scale architecture, which is actually what I feel that I know the most about. I, you know, I've, I've sort of dabble in large scale architectures, but typically uh, I would refer or I would defer to someone who knows more about that than, than I do. You know, my specialty is like more in, in small scale, you know, code bases, how to, how to organize code bases. Um, and and that's where I see the something like fun, functional core imperative shell. That's that's one architecture you could apply in a in a code base and say, okay, we're we're going to write this particular code base according to to that general idea, uh, which basically mm -hmm. means you know let's minimize the amount of of you know non deterministic side effect code and let's you know maximize the amount of pure pure functions that we have. Um, okay. and, and so that's sort of the idea there. Yeah, I was. Uh, I, I think I've conflated them because I came from a SOA background of large mm -hmm. ar enterprise architecture, but then yeah. taking people from that into microservices. And yeah. so I sort of brought the term SOA with me into a microservice where I then said, yeah. we're going to be separating this out into imperative shell functional core. And I sort of just mm -hmm. sort of started calling that uh, like a mini SOA inside of a microservice. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I may have been conflating that for a long time, which may be my mistake. Um, and I, I just think maybe it's easier to say this is a service, you know, oriented architecture instead of saying this is imperative co uh, shell uh, functional yeah. core. Yeah. So maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I should just change my terminology a little bit. Um, I would probably not talk about microservices as as being, you know, imperative shell, uh, functional core imperative shell, um, because everything, you know. What, what typically happens with microservices is that, you know, they, they have to communicate with each other, you know, either synchronously or asynchronously. And all that, you know, IO that happens is, you know, that's by definition impure. You know, it's either something that has a side effect or is non-deterministic. Um, so, so, um, so all the communication between microservices will be, you know, part of the imperative stuff anyway. 
Um, oh yeah, and I was so, definitely trying to focus yeah. in on how the microservice is built internally, not like how internally. The yeah, yeah, no, is. I, and that makes it. You can definitely do, you know, design or implement a microservice with that, you know, style of thinking. Uh, yeah. Yes, that absolutely. Yeah, that makes a lot okay. of sense. Um, yeah, perfect. Um, I'll, uh, I, I've got a, a audience question here. Um, uh -huh. What techniques? In, in using C Sharp, uh, this, is, this is a .NET C Sharp user group. Uh, what techniques have you found useful to help encourage or enforce a more functional core kind of programming in C Sharp? Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, the lowest hanging fruit that um, that I've I've um, had success with that's this is a, a few years uh, back uh, was basically to to um, to get a team to agree that null was not a valid return value. Um, so it's it's not quite the same as as you know you know doing full full on functional core imperative shell, but it's it's a good um, it's a good step towards you know in that direction, and and nowadays if you're on if you're in um, on C sharp seven I believe or or you know or later you can turn on this thing called nullable reference types where you can you know um, you can say with your you know return type that it's going to be knowable or not knowable and, and it's particularly this uh, the, la the latter thing there you know being able to say with a method this is not going to return null uh, that's that's really um that's really important but um i'm sorry i'm just getting some sms's uh, I, sh <laughs> I should have i should have turned on my phone and i just got a little bit confused by that but they, they're probably going to be gone in a moment um so um uh well, okay, so so this is a really um, this is really something that can enhance your productivity quite a lot because you often see people resorting to all sorts of defensive coding where they say, um, I don't know whether this value is going to be null or not, so I better you know I, I better check to see if it's null and then do some ad hoc you know handling of you know if a value is null so it's it's it really saves you a lot of trouble if you can just tell by you know a object's type whether it can be null or not um so back when i started doing that we um this was thing you know long before c sharp 7 uh so um instead of uh, we couldn't say you know that we could use the nullable reference type language feature because it, it, it didn't uh, exist. So what we did instead is we introduced this little, you know, idea of, of a maybe of T, you know, a gen little generic container. So basically you can think about this this thing called maybe, it's also called, called option. Um, some languages call it option of T, some lang call, languages call it maybe of T. And you can think of this little container as, as it's basically a collection um, that is constrained so that instead of having, you know, zero, one, two, three, four elements and so on, it's a collection that's constrained so that it can either have, you know, zero or one element. So that's the only two options that you have there. Uh, so, so instead of, of you know, um, instead of, of dealing with values that may or may not be null, um, you can model you know, the absence or the presence of a value in terms of having this maybe of T or option of T. Um, so we introduced this little maybe of, t we called it maybe of T in this code base. And then we had this rule, we said, you know, as a, um, as a general rule, no return values are allowed to be null. If, if you return a null value, it's a bug in the method that returns the null value so it that this means callers of methods should never have you know they should never have to um to do, do defensive coding um because if the return value turns out to be a null you can always you know treat that as a bug in the code that returned the null value instead of having to do defensive coding all the time um so so once once that team really got the hang of uh, of that way of thinking about things they were really really happy with that because it just it took so, took away a lot of the angst of you know who you know how should i deal with null values here because you could basically you could tell um you know if you had you know a, let's say a database query for example you know you you want to query you know you, you want to read you know query for a user so you pass you know a user id to a database query and then you have this method that returns maybe of user and that tells you you have to explicitly deal with the with the absence of a user but on the other hand if you have a method that returns a user not wrapped in maybe but just a user 
you know that you don't have to deal with the absence of the user because it's it's always going to be there. And if it turns out to be null anyway, you can file a bug in in the in the method that that returned the null value. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So once they get once they got the hang of that, they actually started to think about um, some other things that you could do in in that sort of you know following the the, the same sort of philosophy. Um, because I made no, I made no um, secret out of that. You know, maybe of T is not something that I had invented. It's just something that I stole from you know, statically type functional programming. Um, because then you know, the next uh, one of the next questions that can come up is that sometimes you want to um, instead of just returning nothing, you want to return some sort of error code or you know some error message or error object that that indicates all right you didn't get the user, but there might be various different reasons why you didn't get the user. So here is you know some another data structure that's going to tell you okay why didn't you get the user because you might want to you know deal with the various different reasons in different ways um, so that leads you to another you know thing from from functional programming that's called either um, or some people call it the result uh, so res result of t or you know um, result of t or, or you know there's, there's typically going to be two generic type I, you know parameters there one for success and one for failure but but anyways again that's also a, a you know just a, um, a well-known you know, idea from functional programming. Um, so they started adopting that as well because they understood where that maybe of T came from and they, you know, got curious and started to look into, you know, what else can we do? Um, so that turned out to be a quite an, in, um, uh, an effective way of getting people into thinking more functionally. That's your original yeah. question. Uh, just yeah, to so. make a little short, you know, end on this, uh, this team ended up going totally overboard with this. So uh, I think I've posted some of, of the, um, with permission, some of the code they ended up writing where it was quite uh, ridiculous in terms of that they pulled in so many ideas from statically type functional programming that, you know, if you didn't know statically type functional programming, the C sharp code didn't really make any sense to you anymore. And that's where where they decided, okay, let's just switch to F sharp because you know it's it it doesn't really you know it it, it there's no um there's no benefit in in staying with C sharp any 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 longer because you co you couldn't just take some you know some some person off the street and, and who says I know C sharp I've been a C sharp developer for ten years and you could you know if you try to take even a very seasoned C sharp program and dump them into this code base they would be completely lost unless they knew functional programming. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But then again, you know, if you could find someone who knows functional programming, maybe, you know, maybe a language like F sharp is a better fit. Uh, so that's actually what what that team ended up doing. Um, like that. Yeah, so that's, that's a little bit of a, an ironic in, uh, twist, uh, you know, story twist there at the end. Um, um, yeah. But that's, you know, so I know, very long answer to your question there. But you know, just starting with with this idea of trying to eliminate null as a thing that is you know legal in a code base that actually takes you it doesn't it doesn't really it, it's not that it it's explicitly has something to do with functional programming but it's something that you know languages like haskell and ocaml and f sharp um they pioneered this um way of working with um they you know particularly haskell doesn't have nulls at all um so so they have lot you know developed lots of techniques for you know not you know they have different ways of not having null. Um, so, so this is um, how should I say this? You know, having a good strategy for dealing with null is often a um, fairly low-hanging fruit in, in the sense that most teams don't like null reference exceptions. So, if you if you come and tell a team that I have a fairly good way of avoiding null reference exceptions. You can get most teams to listen to what what it is that you have to to suggest because that's always a pain. Um, so um, so that's one way you can sort of sneak ideas from functional programming in. Um, I love it. Not that it's sneaky, but you know it's it's, it's, it's <laughs> a good way. It's a good way to introduce people to to to, to ideas like that. Sometimes you got to okay. be a little bit sneaky. <laughs> yeah, I didn't actually do it to be sneaky, but I just, you know, found after I'd done this that, you know, this, oh, this actually works pretty well. Uh, so <laughs> it, it's not that I had, you know, this grand master plan before I started out that it's just turned turned out to be a, a good way of doing it. Okay. 
Okay. Um, uh, there are some other user questions, but I want to get to some of my questions uh-huh. first. Um, so in your book, you talk about cyclomatic uh, complexity. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's the number of paths that your code could split off and take to different to create different paths conditionally and yeah. whatnot. Um, so you also talk about guard clauses in your book. I don't know if you're going to know mm-hmm. where this is going. But you also, in your Plo blog, wrote about guard clauses. Uh, and you said something about some people don't consider guard clauses worthy of unit testing. Ah, I'm right. one of those yes. people. Uh, I actually wrote a couple, did a couple videos recently on on that, as well as a video on the Mamie Monad, which I'd love mm-hmm. your feedback on. But we'll get into oh, yeah. that some other time. All right, cool. <laughs> um, so on on the same note, I'd, I'd assert that a guard clause actually, since a guard clause signals the end of a path, it's like a conditional return, like, hey, we're going to stop this path and get out of here. Oh, yeah. I would I would assert that a guard clause doesn't add to cyclomatic complexity um, calculation. So it doesn't. It's not a contributing mm-hmm. factor. Uh, so I'm curious what what your thoughts are on that. Where a guard clause is the end of a path, it's not starting a new path. What yeah. are your thoughts on that? Uh, on my assertion on that. Um, so you did mention a little bit about you know whether or not we should unit test it, and I think we could come back to that in a moment. Um, a guard clause definitely adds to your cyclomatic complexity. That is, you know, the definition of cyclomatic because well, um, the, the the definition of cyclomatic complexity is that you have to count the branches and the and the for loops, and it is you know it is indisputably a branch in as far as I can tell. Uh, Visual Studio at least would agree with me because if you um, if you Write you know three guard clauses and and then have a you know a happy path through a, a method. Um, so that's you know three three guard clauses and a happy path. You know I count that as four, and Visual Studio would also report to you that the cyclomatic complexity of such a method is four. Um, so I think um, you know in in that um, in that respect, it's I haven't seen any other take on cyclomatic complexity that. that that doesn't count the um, the guard clauses. Um, so I would definitely say that they they do um, they do factor in. But but then again, you know, if you can, um, if you have, let's say you have, th- you know, let's just say you have three three guard clauses uh, where you check for three different things, but you in all three cases you do the same thing. You throw in a, you know an exception or something like that, or maybe you return a null object. Um, if you then go and and extract those three guard clauses into one helper method uh, that you know then you know th- throws the appropriate exception maybe something like that. Um, then again, Visual Studio would then would, would, would then agree that, that then you have you know just one guard clause even though that you know helper method itself you know has a cyclomatic com- complexity of maybe three. Um, so you can so you can definitely hide the you know um, the way that the cyclomatic complexity is defined is is very explicitly on the, the branching visible in a body of code. So if you have, you know, a, a call, you know, in one of the branches, if you have a method call that then calls into something else that um, that has a cyclomatic complexity of, let's say, 42, it's not like you have to take those 42 and add, you know, to whatever it is that you're counting inside of your method. Um, cyclomatic complexity is defined as being just what you can actually see inside the method. So what's hidden behind, you know, calls to other methods or calls to other procedures and so on, those don't count. Um, so, so in terms of guard clauses, for example, you could probably uh, hide some of the multiple branches in a guard clause in, in a helper method and then, you know, reduce the, the cyclomatic complexity a little bit. Um, okay. uh, I've never, I've never heard the, um, the argument, the other ways th- that you just, just gave. That's the first time I've heard that. Uh, so yeah. I, I, I was think... curious if you'd heard that before and I want to, yeah. I, I want to dig into that at some other point. I don't want to take the, mm-hmm. the rest of this talk um, okay. and, and maybe even have like a round table discussion. Maybe you're there, but, but maybe just some other people, um, and 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 I'm curious if I can make my point to to say certain guard clauses at least don't count toward it. But I I was just curious if you'd heard it before. So yeah, we we, we don't have to go into this, but we can we can always return to it later. But on because but you, but you did mention use uh, you know unit testing also, and um, and I've been going back and forth over my career on whether or not I th- think you should unit test those. Um, so we can always you know. I, I, I wouldn't necessarily say that you always have to do that, but that's an, that's another thing. We can always get back to that if you think that's an interesting discussion. I do, but I, I do have other questions also. So. That's, that's, that's okay. That's okay. 
Um, okay, uh, so your your book follows a fairly common pattern of having DTO objects on the front boundary, and then those DTO objects are transferred, translated into uh, uh, domain models. Um, it's also possible that there's there's similar models. So there might be models inside of an SDK project, perhaps, or on the back boundary you have entities that are related to the database, mm-hmm. and these models all all look the same, and so you have duplication. And I I, I think I know we're going to go with this. I just want to have the question out there on on a on a stream. So in that case, there's there's copies everywhere. Um, some people will say, why do I have to have all these copies of the same thing? Right. Um, and I, I don't want you to repeat the same things that you that you read, wrote about directly about the DTO to the domain model. Mm-hmm. But at a bigger scale, you also have entities. You also have SDK models, possibly, and some view models and all these different things. Uh, so what's your what's your high level pushback or, or against that? Uh, yeah, so. Um it's it's a um, so first of all this is a um, this is a topic that's I I I'm probably gonna wrestle with on my deathbed as well uh, you know <laughs> I, this is a really difficult topic and and so what I'm gonna answer what I'm gonna tell you next is probably not gonna be my final word on this it was just what you know where I am with this after you know I, I'm I'm in my third decade of programming now. Uh, and I've changed my position on this particular question many times. Um, but I think I've reached a point where it makes some sense to me, at least. Um, I have increasingly become disillusioned by having too many types that model the same thing. So, so for example, I don't really like you know object relational mappers. I, I tend to avoid them because I think they make things more complicated. As you know, they create more problems than they solve. Um, but um, so people would often ask me, for example, so what do you do then if you can't have object relational mappers? And and I say, well, uh, what I typically just do is I just you know fall back uh, to straight old-fashioned ADO, you know, the ADO, the objects. What do you? I don't even know what that acronym is anymore, but you know it's been around since you know basically .dot.net one. Uh, this thing with you know you have a SQL command and a SQL connection, and the SQL command can you can put parameters on that, and then you just fire that off with you know a string which is just you know SQL basically. Um, and um, I find that you know uh, useful in in um, in many cases, but it's not that you don't have copying of you know of data structures from one place to another it's just that i don't have you know an object that represents let's again you know go back with the ubiquitous user example so we have let's say we have a user we have a user with a first name a last name and a display name and an email address and probably some other properties as well um so what you would do with an object relational mapper like entity framework for example is that you would have an object called user or user record or something like that with those you know first name last name properties and so on um, but if that's not your domain model which i think it shouldn't be uh, then you need to go and and do you know copy the domain model's first name to the you know entity's you know first name property and copy the last name to the last name and so on so, so there's all this you know mapping going on um, if you don't have the entity it doesn't necessarily mean that you don't have to do the mapping. You still have to do the mapping because if you, even if you do, you know, ADO.net as I do, uh, you still have to say, okay, so the the first name property from the domain model needs to go into a, you know, a SQL parameter called first name. You know, it's just called, you know, it's just called, you know, at first name because it's it's now a T SQL parameter instead of being, you know, a C sharp object property. Uh, but the mapping still needs to. To happen, and also when you read from the database, you get a SQL reader back, and then you need to index into the SQL reader and say, okay, the column called first name, well, I will now map to, you know, to the first name variable in my domain model. So the so the the copying still needs to take place. Um, so um, so this is basically just to say this is one of the reasons why I still think that um, that I'm not done with the question that you just asked because there will. It seems to me that there's always going to be some some mapping going on. So why are we having those um, why are we having those different representations of the same data? Might be you know a good question to ask ourselves because uh, you know I, I've often seen lots of, of um, 
uh, architecture diagrams where people would basically say, well, we have these layers, we have the user interface layer and the, you know, the, the business logic layer in the middle and the data access, you know, the data object, uh, the data access layer in the bottom. And then you have this sort of, excuse me, this vertical thing going on where, you know, this, I've seen, you know, a diagram like that a lot where, you know, the vertical thing that crosses, cuts across everything is just called entities. And the entities would go all the way, you know, from, from the, from the user interface down into the database. And that would typically be defined by something like, you know, entity framework or something similar. Um, so why not, why not do that? And I think one of the reasons why, um, why that's not interesting or what, why that's dangerous is that it, um, it robs you of a chance of having good encapsulation. Um, so, um, instead of talking about databases, let's talk about, you know, what, what comes in at the application boundary. So I typically do REST APIs. Um, that's what I mostly know uh, about, but you can imagine something with the user interface as well. But when you receive data that, you know, from the real world, um, in a REST API, for example, you get data that's not really been validated yet. So it could be basically anything. Uh, and, uh, and maybe you have some framework stuff where you say, okay, I'm gonna, you know, in a REST API, you might say, um, we can receive JSON or XML. And uh, if the input is not formatted as JSON or XML, the, let's say the ASP.NET um, system is just gonna, you know, tell the caller that uh, this is a bad request. Um, so so you, you do know a little bit when you, when, if you actually receive an object that has been dehydrated or, you know, been read from JSON into a DTO, you do know that it, at least it was valid JSON. So it does tell you a little bit, but that's basically what, what, uh, what you know. You don't know much more than that. Um, you can, again, annotate some things where you say, okay, um, this, this property, you know, particularly with the nullable reference type, you know, option now, you can say, oh, this string, uh, which is the ID should always be there because it's it can't be null. Uh, so you could do you know a few things like that where you can annotate uh, various different properties by saying this should be, always be there. Um, but since a, a transmission um, a transmission uh, format like JSON, for example, it's very limited in what you can actually express in it. So just something like a date, for example, a date and a time. Um, you would typically transmit that as a string and you could transmit that as an ISO, what is that, 8601, I, I believe the ISO code is. So you could transmit that as some, some sort of, you know, well-known date and, and time format. Um, but when you receive the object, and there's an example of that in the book, when you receive like something like a reservation, for example, um, you need to know the date and the time for the reservation, but it's just a string um, because that's all you know, JSON can model. So now you need to, you know, have a look at that string and then figure out whether you can pass that into, you know, a real daytime, you know, uh, daytime value in C sharp, for example. Um, so you could write some validation code that, you know, validates whether that string is actually looks appropriate. Um, but if you only do validation where you say, okay, here's the validation you know, method that says true or false, you know, this input was good versus this input is bad, um, you, you're sort of throwing away the parsing that you just did. You had to pass the string in order to figure out whether it actually represents a, you know, a proper date and time. But then if you, if you only return a Boolean value afterwards, you, lost the, you just lost the information that you, know, you could actually have passed this string into a stronger, um, into a type with stronger semantics. Um, so, uh, so there's this idea of instead of you know just validating things and figuring out whether they're true or false, you say, um, all right, I want to capture that this DTO represents valid input, and how do I capture you know that knowledge so in such a way that all the other you know recipients of that object they they know that they don't have to do you know validation again and again they don't have to check for you know malformed values and so on they don't have to do defensive coding how do i communicate that this is already okay and this is the idea behind encapsulation this uh, you know which is an old idea encapsulation is this idea that an object is all 
always in a valid state. Um, so basically, we can say DTOs, their definition of a valid state is basically just that they sort of, you know, capture something that can go on the wire. So if you have, in my book, for example, I have a reservation DTO. And the only thing that is that is that we can say about a, a reservation DTO is that it serializes into co co to correct JSON and it can be deserialized from correct JSON into a reservation DTO. But apart from that, we can't really say much more about it um, because what what that means, you know, that's its definition of validity. It's basically just does it, you know, um, does it map to to a JSON? document mm -hmm. basically that's yeah. that's what validity means for the dto whereas if we look at a reservation domain object it has um further rules associated with it for example we say um the um the date and time for the reservation is not just a string it's actually it has to be a valid you know date time value and we can also say the quantity requested for the um, for the for the reservation must be a positive number uh, which is again something in the DTO, you know, you could have a JSON document where the quantity is set to minus 42 and and that would be valid in the sense that this is something that is transmittable over an HTTP request. Um, whereas we can say that's not a valid reservation, even though it is a valid JSON document. Uh, so being able to to capture that um, that you've done some extra, you know, checks on on the data that was inside of the DTO, you want to be able to model that in such a way that that um, that every other you know client code that has to deal with the reservation, they sh they they just automatically know that this all this data input validation has already taken place, and the object that you're now working with is guaranteed to be in a valid state. Uh, so that's why we have those translations between, you know, you have the DTO, which represents the very weak guarantees that you, that you're being given by, you know, the tr transmission protocol, and then the much more, you know, the stronger guarantees that um, that something like validation can give you. Uh, so that's why we need to have both of those because they they play different roles, they serve different purposes. Um, mm -hmm. That's again a very long uh, answer to your question. So yeah. I'm sorry, <laughs> and I'm sorry that I can't just do it in two sentences each, each for each question. Uh, but, I, but I hope that makes sense. But you know, again, I've tried to explain uh, those ideas, you know, more and uh, sort of try to lay it out in the book uh, with even more details and lots of examples. Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's really good. I, I think it's, it's basically the uh, they change for different reasons. Um, so yeah. even if the properties yeah, look the same, too. they change for different reasons. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so uh, when this, I, I want to jump to this because it's it's one of my questions I definitely wanted to get to, even though I'm skipping around and moving some things possibly. Um, when you put validation logic, it, this is somewhat related to what you're talking about, uh, I comparable and, and other types of code that, that, does, that does validation to make sure the state's good and all that sort of stuff. When you put that into an otherwise anemic domain model, mm -hmm. uh, do you do you consider that object oriented programming? And I, th I think what I'm really also getting at is, <clears throat> if you're doing the the bulk of your code is let's say um, functional core imperative uh, imperative wrapped, and then you have and then also like one of your blogs say the boundaries of your application aren't object oriented. Mm -hmm. So, what how much of your code that you're doing is object oriented is what I'm I'm curious about. Um, this really depends on your definition of object oriented i would say um, you know if you um uh if you if you take a look at the at the um at the source code the sample code that is you know that accompanies the book um i would consider that to be fairly state of the art in terms of how i would do c sharp programming if i had to also take into account that there's a team that needs to understand what's going on there. I, you know, there are some things I could have done more in a more sophisticated way. And, I, and again, but you know, if I wanted to be very sophisticated, I could have written the code in, in F sharp or in Haskell. Um, so, but but if I'm taking into account, you know, the, the way that I tried to write the code in the book was thinking about, um, okay, so if this is a team, you know, if this is a code for a team that um, is, you know. It consists of, you know, colleagues of mine that are 
curious, they want to learn, but um, but they may not be, they, you know, they probably don't know all the things that I know. They know other things that I don't know, but, you know, we have, you know, uh, only a small intersection of all the things we, that we all know uh, that we have in common. If I, if I wanted to target a source code base at, you know, that level of developer, that's basically, you know, what, how I would write the code the way that I've written in, in, um, in the book. Um, so I'm not doing very sophisticated things in terms of a lot of generics and a lot of functional programming techniques. I use a few, uh, but not that much. Um, but there is probably people who would say that it's not object oriented um, because there's so little state mutation going on. You know, everything that needs to uh, model a state change would basically, you know, be, uh, you know, take a copy of the of the reservation, for example, and then you know return um, return a co that copy with the few things that that had to change, and, and then you know apply those to the database uh, again. Um, and um, so there's a lot of the, you know things like that going on, uh, lots of, of of querying where you can ask objects about you know various things, whether you know whether a reservation could fit on a table and and so on. Uh, but it's all it's all based on you know, a lot of deterministic, you know, um, query based, uh, you know, reading, reading, you know, uh, getting data from other objects and so on. Um, and, and there's almost no state change in, uh, going on there. So whether you consider that to be, you know, object oriented or not, um, that probably depends on your definition of object oriented. Um, I think it's quite nicely object oriented. If you ask me, I think it's I think it's object oriented. My, uh, Robert C. Martin has this this um, idea about you know object orientation and functional programming not actually being at odds, but but are more like you know they're sort of like perpendicular, you know, independent things. Where you know his position is that you can do object oriented functional, you know, programming and. Um, to a certain degree, I think he's right. I don't think they're completely independent, but uh, but it's not like you can't, you know, it's not that you can't mix them. And I think what I've done here is a, is a fairly decent mix where um, I think if you um, if you just came into the code base, but, but I, I don't know how much uh, chance you've had to look at the code base, but I would guess that if you come into the code base and you don't really know what to expect, you'd probably say, oh, this is probably, this is a little bit, unusual in the way that it does things, but I still get it. That's my hope anyway. Um, but but I try to design it in that way where, where it, it you wouldn't, or, you know, you, you shouldn't go to it immediately and say, oh, this is functional programming. You would probably just go to it and say, yeah, this is a little bit of an unusual take on object oriented programming, but yeah, I could probably, I, I still get it. You know, that's my hope uh, anyways. Um, so, yeah. um, Again, I, th I think I'm drifting off from your original question. Uh, so bring me back in. What, what was your original question? <laughs> I, I think that I think you pretty much answered it perfectly. Oh, good. Uh, when, oh, when I looked at your code base, I, I'm like, this looks like code that I write. This is, uh -huh. this is code that I write. And it's like you said, I, I don't want to go too far off the deep end getting super mm -hmm. functional because right. you're going you're gonna to lose a lot of the job market out there. You're going to have to rehire yeah. developers. It's, it gets crazy. Uh, but I've also been been to uh, a lot of clients where I say, "Hey, let's do things in this way," and they're especially their older older uh, developers say, "You're breaking all kinds of object oriented rules. This is an object oriented." And right. so I have to sort of push back against it and say, yeah. "I realize it's not exactly what it was, you know, in the '90s and whatnot." Mm -hmm. uh, which I mean, I, you and I both were developing in the '90s, so it, it, I know it's not the same thing. But yeah. this is. This is the way we need to be moving, um, and I get a lot of that pushback. Uh, that it's, and I, I have to agree with them. It's not object-oriented programming in the purest way from twenty years ago. It's, it's different. Uh, yeah, but again, you know, the the, dis dis the discussion always comes up. You know, what would Alan Kay say? Uh, because you know, once that discussion comes up, you know, people will will ultimately bring up Alan Kay and his idea of object orientation, which, as far as I understand it, is a completely different from what we actually got. Um, so, so one thing you could probably, um, one thing that I try to tell people when they say it's not object oriented is, is that, 
I try to understand what it, what sort of object orientation they have in mind, and often it's an idea about object orientation that that has an, its origins in uh, maybe in C plus plus, or maybe in a particular flavor of object orientation that they picked up from Java and, and you know early Java you know style architecture, mm -hmm. um, which is one you know interpretation of objects orientation, but it's not. You know, it seems that it's not really what Alan Kay originally had in mind. And also, if you go back and read something like um, uh, Bertrand Meyer's uh, Object Oriented, what's, what's it called? Uh, Bertrand Meyer has this book, you know, he's, he's the guy who created Eiffel. And he, and he has this book from the, the mid 80s called something like Object Oriented Software Construction, I think the title is. Um, and, and this is where he outlines, for example, that, you know, when I talk about encapsulation, this idea of, you know, being that encapsulation is defined by an object must always be in a valid state. Um, that's his idea. That's what he, you know, writes back in the mid 80s saying, well, that's how we define an object. It should always have a, you know, it should have a contract. The contract should specify what is valid and the, it's the object's responsibility of you know guaranteeing it's you know upholding its part of of, um, of that contract and um and i think if you go and look at you know you know the, some some of those naysayers that you're talking about there if you go and look at just you know if you just casually browse through their code you will probably my guess is you'll probably find lots of places where it, it, they break encapsulation left and right because they allow objects to be initialized that are not, you know, in a valid state when they're being initialized, and you know all sorts of things like that. Uh, so you could always, um, I don't, I don't, I don't say this is a good strategy, but I think you'd always shoot back at those people and saying, well, yeah, but what you're doing is not object oriented either. But at this point, you shut down the discussion. So it's, yeah, it's, it's, pro <laughs> it's probably not the best, you know way of, of you know leading with but if they get very obstinate uh, sometimes you, you can start to have those discussions where you say yeah what is really object orientation when when we you know there, there are different takes on it and we and and there's one style you know from c plus plus and and java that, that became very prevalent uh, but it's not the only interpretation of object oriented programming there are other you know interpretations out there um, that might actually, you know, fit better with, you know, something like what I present in the book. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, the, the, my main attack vector or defense vector even, um, is that a lot of people, uh, I mean, like, um, uh, a lot of people will say, okay, I, I'm going to go back to what I said earlier about service oriented programming is, mm -hmm. is like what I was trying to talk about. Uh, you have a service, and like what you said, you might have an object like a user you pass into the service. It might do some things internally, maybe functional, maybe imperative shell, and it'll pass you back an object perhaps. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, uh, you, uh, old old school object oriented people will say you have the user. The user should be the combination of state and process, mm -hmm. and and uh, and so it will do its own process. It might send a message off to something else to say, save me yeah. in the database, but it's saying, right. save me in the database. So I, I sort of make those the contrasts of of the lines. But I, I love your idea that if we just simply say, you can be considered, you could consider this object-oriented programming if you say object-oriented programming is uh, whenever you create an object, that object is always in a valid state, uh, I think. I think that's a very, it's fairly simplistic and it's really easy to follow, I guess, with, with that type of rule. Yeah, that's that's the idea behind encapsulation. And But most people see this idea of encapsulation as being very, very core to the idea of object-oriented programming. Um, so you can always say that, you know, this is the idea from Bertrand Meyer's book from the mid 80s, because um, it's true, uh, but also no one has read that book, so <laughs> uh, so you can always you can always just tell them that that's the case. Now, it's I mean that's 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 probably a little unfair, but it's actually I picked the idea up from that book, uh, you know, because I think it's it's a nice way of of um, it's this is actually a one sentence explanation of what is encapsulation. Well, it's it is guaranteeing that the object is already always in a valid state. It's you know. It's it's fairly it's fairly it's a fairly easy concept to get across. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I did have uh, some input from 
from the audience. Uh, so mm. given your experience with software development as an engineering discipline, um, I, I don't mean to put that in quotes. It should be the norm that it's an engineering discipline. It should not be a quotable thing. Uh, but given your experience as an engineering discipline, where do you see the said the engineering discipline headed? Uh, so given the popular growth of facilities uh, like uh, artificial intelligence um, and the limitations of human cognition and whatnot, where do you see that proceeding as an engineering principle? Right. Um, so, um, so there's this guy called Hillel Wayne, uh, which I, I, whom I follow on Twitter, and uh, he actually did something interesting in the, in that uh, regard because he's, he um, he did a um, set of interviews with various different engineers who had started out being, uh, if you will, real engineers, uh, you know, construction engineers or electrical engineers and chemical engineers, and then they crossed over into software development. Uh, so he did a set of interviews uh, with with those people and and tried to talk to them about you know what what they found was you know what commonalities and what what was different between real engineering in in air quotes and um, and uh, and software development uh, and um, and he think uh, you know so so he has a three part blog post series uh, that you should definitely go and read if you're interested in in that in that um, question. Um, but he found that first of all, um, real engineering is is probably it sounds like real engineering is more, um, or it's, it's rather it's less disciplined and it's less um, there's more room for uh, for creative work and uh, you know winging it than we software developers probably you know normally think of. There's actually a lot of creative work going into you know real engineering. Um, they do have some um, some extra some extra things that 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 we might look towards and and and, uh, and learn from. But but his you know Hillel Wayne's conclusion is also that we actually have some things that they're very envious. For example, and the most you know uh, profound thing that everyone else should envy us is um, is source control. You know we have with git nowadays we have source control pretty much figured out and we are probably the only profession in the world that has figured out this problem you know everyone else is struggling with with this problem you know and, and engineers do that as well they have all those you know you know uh, the diagram the you know the the final draft diagram part one you know final final da diagram you know final final Part two, uh, you know, all those things where files are just being emailed around and, and things like that. Um, so, um, so they could definitely learn from us, and that's what they, you know, at least his uh, informants. That's that's what what they, they told him. Uh, but I think, and, and and one of the reasons why the book is called, you know, it has the subtitle "Heuristics for Software uh, Engi uh, Yeah, Heuristics for Software Engineering," is that um, I think a lot of the things, a lot of the ideas in the book are extra things that you can do to make a software development process a little bit more um, predictable, if you will, or more manageable. Uh, and, and, and I start very simple, like things like, you know, use, use, use source control, use Git, uh, but I, I suppose everyone does that. Almost everyone does that these days. Uh, so that's a very long, long, uh, low hanging fruit. But then, you know, uh, and this is in, in, uh, this is in chapter two, uh, so very early on in the process, I say, well, there are things you can do that most people just don't do, um, but I don't know why they don't do it. And and this might be something like turning, you know, taking all the the warnings that the compiler will emit. You know, so the C sharp compiler emits lots of warnings if you do various things uh, that are suspect. And uh, there's this flag you can you can just turn it on and say all warnings should be errors, and that means if you have a compiler warning, um, your code doesn't compile. And um, and I don't know why people don't do that, uh, but but that is a very simple thing where you can say it's already there. Um, there is knowledge built into the compiler. You know those warnings are very rarely wrong. You know if you if you look at a, a C sharp compiler warning, and actually understand what it is that it says to you, you will ninety nine percent of the time want to fix the code because you know that's not what you you know you thought you were doing something but the compiler is telling you yeah it's probably not what you think it is doing this is probably not going to do what what you think you're doing are you sure about this and then you look at it and you say no actually you're right thank you compiler i will now change the code um yeah. so so this is just one example there are myriads of those examples where you can say 
there are things you can do um, you, where you can add a little extra level of discipline to your to your process. And some of them are tools driven like this, where you can just ask the compiler to help you out. And sometimes, um, sometimes the extra things you can do is, is more, uh, you, they're more pr process oriented. Like for example, again, you know, most engineers will have some sort of sign off pro process where when they make diagrams and so on, uh, they might actually have someone else to look at the changes that they made and you know sign them off and so on. And we have that as well, or we can do that as well in software development. We call that a code review. Uh, and uh, I've met organizations who do code reviews and, and then I've met most organizations don't do them. Um, but again, I think it's one of those things where um, it's a step towards being more, you know, behaving more like an engineering team if you if you adopt uh, adopt some of those practices. Um, so again, mm -hmm. the, the the idea with the book is that it's it it's meant as a catalog of all sorts of different ideas, and I'm not saying you should adapt uh, adopt all of the ideas in the book, but you can you know read the book and get some a sense of of some of the things you can do, and then you can adopt the ones that you feel um, will um, will improve your own organization. And then, you know, I'm not at all claiming that the ideas in the book are, you know, that those are all the ideas that are, you know, that, that there's going to be plenty of other ideas that I just didn't think of or, you know, that, you know, that other teams have, have thought of uh, that, uh, that, again, will make uh, the process, the development process a little bit more predictable, if you will. Um, mm -hmm. Something that I didn't really mention. I may may have mentioned something like A/B testing just in passing in the book, but it's not something that I go into because, uh, well, I have to admit that I have no you know practical experience with that myself. So I thought, well, I should probably leave that alone. But you know, that's that's <laughs> another thing. That's another thing you can do where you know lots of people have reported that A/B testing has really worked wonders for them. Um, and and again, it's it's a great way of of adding some extra. Um, and, you know, some heuristics, a, a bit of methodology into your, into the process that, you know, can guide you towards making good decisions, which I, I, be, I believe that's ultimately what engineering is about, um, as far as I can tell. It's give, you know, get as much process in place that so that it enables you to make good decisions. I think that's, that's probably a good um, way to phrase it. Nice.